chapter 2 is where we're at. We are in Peter's sermon. We're going we're gonna to get to the end of his sermon tonight. But before we get into what we're going to look at tonight, uh, we're going to start in about somewhere around verse 25. Peter's going to reach back to the Old Testament. L- let me give you something to think about, okay, with this. First of all, let, let, let me just say this pertaining to you and I, whenever we run into people today, what we have to realize is this, that when you and I encounter people that are unchurched, and that's a lot of people today that are unchurched, they may have heard of Jesus. Most, I'll say this, probably the majority of people have, but to them, he is but a distant figure. He's somebody that lived a long time ago. They don't know they don't know who he was. They don't understand that he had come into the world to die for their sins. They don't understand that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah. They don't understand that he's coming back and he's going to set up a kingdom and he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. They don't know any of that. They don't they don't know that. And so our responsibility as believers is to be equipped to be able to tell them who Jesus is. They need to know that in order to be saved. You'll see that as we go through this tonight. And so I've I've often, I often likened it to what Paul said in Philippians chapter one, and I I can't quote the verse, but uh, whether he would live or die, he wanted Christ to be magnified in his body. So Paul kind of viewed himself like a telescope looking at a faraway star. That's how we are. We are are telescopes through which the unsaved world can see Christ. To them, he's a far distant figure, lived thousands of years ago. But in our lives, we're to bring him closer, just just like a telescope brings a star closer so that people can examine it or plan it closer. So we are to bring Christ closer to people whenever we meet them. And so we need to be very mindful that is our responsibility, to go and to magnify Christ to a lost and a dying world. Peter understood that. Now, Peter's crowd was a little bit different. Peter's crowd knew of Christ. They crucified him. So you've got to understand that to this crowd, Jesus was viewed as a false prophet. He was viewed as somebody that came and professed to be the Messiah, but they were looking for a Messiah that would set up the kingdom, one that would would come in and overthrow the Roman Empire. They weren't looking for somebody like Jesus. They missed the fact of what the Old Testament said about him, Isaiah 53 and uh, Psalm 16 and things of that sort that talked about his death and his resurrection. They missed all of that. They didn't understand it. And so what Peter does in his sermon, and and this is a really good lesson for you and I, he's going to tell them who Jesus was, who he is. And he's going to use the scriptures to do that very thing, which is a great reminder to you and I, if you've ever wondered... What do I say to somebody that, that, a, that a, an acquaintance or a friend that, that isn't saved? What do I say? I, I don't know if I have the words. You don't need your words. You just need God's word. That's it. You just share verses with them. Find verses that pertain to who Christ is, that he's the savior of the world, that he came and died for their sins and, and paid the penalty and that he loves them and so on and so forth. John three sixteen, and you know all of the verses. First Corinthians fifteen. There are many of them that you and I can use. But as I came through this, and I and I, I was up early this morning, and I was thinking about this, and uh, I was thinking, you know, Peter just took the time to tell him who Christ was, and explain what the Old Testament said about him. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. So with that said, let me get you to your paper. I could go on on this for a long time tonight as I meditated on this throughout the day. The introduction says this. Last week in our study of Acts, we stopped in Acts 2.24. 
But we did not get to the last statement of the verse. Watch 2.24. Here's what it says. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. That's what we looked at last week, the pains of death that Jesus experienced and that the unsaved experience. And then it says this, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. In other words, it was impossible for Jesus to stay in the grave. That, would ne- that just could not happen. And he's going to go on and tell us why. But let me go back to your paper. Peter tells his audience that it was not possible that Jesus would be, it should say, held by the grave. He was appointed to die, and he was appointed to rise from the dead. In the text before us, we find several proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So say, okay, so there's a lot of different ways to look at what Peter's going to say. I mentioned the proofs of the resurrection and but i also want to see this as a way that he explains who he was and then he will get right down to the end and he will be very pointed with the message as you shall see watch 25 through 31 he's going to quote from psalm 16 here four now that's a connective okay so he just said at the end of verse 24 because it was not possible that he should be holden of it holden of death of the grave could not hold him and then the verse the first word of verse 25 tells you why it could read like this because david speak speaketh concerning him i foresaw the lord always before my face for he's on my right hand that i should not be moved therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption thou hast made known to to me the ways of life thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance men and brethren let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch david that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day therefore being a prophet and knowing that god had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up christ to sit on his throne He's seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. I want to go back, and I want to pull that apart a little bit. So let me just start here on your paper. And I want to gather some things as we go through this that are really good for us. Uh, First of all, uh, this is David's prophecy is what we're looking at. This is one of the proofs of the resurrection, but here's what it says. Here in these verses, Peter points back to Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a very interesting psalm. Now watch this. It is penned by David, but it's from the heart of Jesus. I want us to take some time and look at some of the details of the psalm because it is far too valuable to skip quickly over it. Okay, I wanted to get the whole thing, and I, but I didn't. I, I thought, no, we've got to move on through this instead of spending one, time, one night in one area. But here's what Psalm 16, this is what they... Uh, Peter quoted Psalm 16, 8 through 11. He said this, I have set the Lord always before me. Now keep this in mind. Okay, here's what I want you to get. David's writing it, but Jesus is speaking it. This is, this is his words. Watch, well, I'll show you this. Watch as we go through this again. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth, rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. See, this is Jesus speaking. Neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. In other words, the body of Christ would not deteriorate. So this is P- David writing, Peter quoting, But these are the words of Jesus, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Thou will show me the path of life, and the presence, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So this is Jesus talking about his reliance, his dependence upon the Father as he went through the struggles of life. Watch this. These are the words of of Jesus through David's writing. What I want you to see is that Jesus needed to keep his eyes on the Father as he faced the sufferings of his earthly life. I want to show you something that took place the night which Jesus was arrested. Matthew 26, 37 through 39. Watch the verses. 
This is after they've left the upper room and they have come to the garden and he's, he's going to take Peter, James, and John with him deeper into the darkness. But here's, the, here's what it says. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. I want to come back to that in a moment. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Okay, so come to your paper again. The words sorrowful and very heavy are very strong words in the Greek. The words very heavy and exceeding sorrowful are the strongest words in the Bible used to describe sorrow and depression. This night in the garden, as Jesus faced the cross, sorrow swept over him like a crushing wave. The humanity of our Lord was terrified at the death that he was about to die. We don't stop to think about that. The human side of our Lord was terrified at what was about to happen. That's why you find this prayer in, on the screen in verse 39. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Three times he prayed that. And then you remember what happened. The blood came through the pores of his skin like drops of sweat. He was under satanic attack that night, our Lord was, and the pressure that he felt was so great that it squeezed the blood through the pressure through the pores in his skin. Watch the words of Paul here. Here's what he says, and I quote <clears throat> The words in the Greek, those words I showed you, exceeding sorrowful, very heavy. The words in the Greek are expressive of the greatest sorrow imaginable, unquote. Jesus went into a sorrow and into a depression that night beyond anything that we could ever begin to imagine. Remember, we have a high priest that can identify with everything that we go through because he was made perfect in sufferings. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. He was made perfect in sufferings, not perfect in, 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 in who he was, perfect in experience so that he could relate to and identify with you and I whenever we would go through the valleys of life. Let me go back to this. To get him through this, he kept the Lord always before him. Let me go back to Psalm 16, 8 and 9 again. Watch this. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my, my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Listen to me. His eyes stayed focused on the Father is exactly what he did. He kept God in his focus. Our Lord did that. He needed that because life was these, the valleys that he went through, the sufferings that he went through, not just the cross, but before he ever got there. It was that difficult for him. Watch the next line. If Jesus needed to keep his eyes on the Father, how much more do we need to do the same? We face trials and storms, but nothing like our Lord faced. But we certainly need our God in the midst of the storms. Let us notice how the saints of the Old Testament faced the storms. Okay, Hebrews, this is a really good lesson for us. Hebrews eleven, thirteen through 16 says this. Speaking of the giants of the faith, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises, here it comes, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Let me stop for a moment. I want you to listen to me. Those of the Old Testament went through some extremely difficult times. How did they do it? Right here. They kept their focus through their mind's eye. They looked down the corridor of time and they embraced the promises that God had made to them. Namely, the promises of the kingdom. The promises of a king that would rule in a kingdom that they would be a part of. That's how they did it. They kept their eyes focused ahead, not on the circumstances. Verse 14, For they 
that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out of, they might have had opportunity to have returned. In other words, listen, they didn't think about where they came from thinking, you know what, I was better off back there. Maybe I ought to just go back there. No, no. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city, the new Jerusalem. That's what they look for. That's what they focused on in their lives. That's what we need to do as we go through the difficulties of life. You know, I've said this over and over again. We don't know what the future holds. Things are changing every day. You can't even keep up with everything. Now it's Russia and the Ukraine and and cyber warfare and everything else that is going on. And to you and I, that's all kind of foreign. And it's like, you know, what's that mean for me? And I, to tell you the truth, I don't know. But I know if it comes here, if it comes here, it would be devastating to our nation. Our nation runs off of computers. If something come into our nation and shut everything down, then it locks everything up. It locks it all up. That's another time. Watch this. Let me take you back to David's words again. Watch 226. We'll just get it right out of here. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Hope. Watch uh, the line, just short. Our Lord and, and David both had hope because of God's promise. You say, what promise? Watch verses 27 and 28. Because that will not leave my soul in hell. Okay, there again, it's David's pen, but it's Christ speaking. Because that will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with my countenance. Watch this. The promise here is that Jesus' soul would not stay separated from his body. In other words, the promise was that he would live again and his body would not be permitted to decay. Let me raise a question here. What if Jesus did not rise from the dead? One answer is right here. Then then it should say God and his word could not be trusted and he would be found to be a liar. God had foretold through the pen of David that Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. Watch the application. Let us understand that our hope is to be in our Lord and his faithfulness. Our hope is not found in circumstances. It's not. They change all the time. Let us be reminded of what we looked at Sunday evening, this verse, and we didn't spend a lot of time on it, though we could have. 1 Peter 4.19, watch it. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. That's a tremendous statement. God, we are to trust ourselves in whatever we go through, whatever next week holds, whatever next year holds, whatever comes down the road. I am to, I am to submit myself and, and to make a deposit. That's the idea right here, the word commit. It means to make a deposit in a very secure place. I am to basically deposit my soul with him and say, Lord, you are a faithful creator. And I could divide that, and I could say, okay, he's faithful because his word's faithful. Whatever he promises, it will come to pass. As creator, he is all-powerful. He spoke the world into existence. So that means that there's absolutely nothing that can come into my life, nothing that can come into your life that he isn't, he isn't Lord over, that he could not eliminate or he could not move or, or he could not change in a moment. He's in control of all of that. He's more powerful than any situation that we will ever face in our lives. He is our hope, and we need to hold on to that. Come on back to 28 again. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. What's, this is Jesus. What's he talking about? He's talking about the resurrection. Watch this. Jesus knew that there would be joy after his death. He knew the grave could not hold him. Here's the application for us. I'm reminded here of the joy that awaits the believer, awaits you and I. We will die if the Lord tarries. We will die and we will be buried, but the grave will not hold us. 
First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man hath this hope in him, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So, Jesus said, basically, beyond this grave there is a hope. You and I can say this, beyond this life, beyond the death that we will die, there is a hope, because God will not abandon us whenever we die. Our soul goes to be with Him, our our body goes to the ground, and it will return to the dust. Jesus' body never deteriorated. God would not permit that to happen, not the Holy One. But ours will, but he will one day again, he will, may, he will resurrect our body, and we will have brand new glorified bodies. Back to your paper. David's prophe- prophecy is proof that Jesus Christ is alive because it is God's word. It is God's word. Watch the next one. The next evidence of Jesus' resurrection is the presence of David's tomb. Watch this. The questioning among Peter's listeners would have been, how do you know that David was not writing about himself? How do you know that? Well, watch 29 through 31 now. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now, that was a landmark in that day. They knew right where it was. We don't. They did. They knew where it was. They knew where the sepulcher of David was. They knew that he had died, that he had been buried, and he was still in that sepulcher. His body had went back to dust. They knew that. Let me go on. Watch verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now, let me just say something here, okay? That is something that is yet future. Jesus is not seated on the throne today. That will happen when he comes back and sets up the kingdom. Okay? That's not what he's not ruling as a king, like a king today, like, like, like a lot of people teach. That's not the case. He's our high priest today, but he is not seated on the throne. Verse 31. He's seeing this before spake, watch this, of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Basically, back to that question, Peter's listeners would have said, well, how do you know David's not writing about himself? And Peter says, because. He was, David was inspired by God. He was a prophet, and he's writing about Christ. David's still in the ground. He's still in the grave. What's your paper here? The question among Peter's listeners would have been, how do you know that David was not writing about himself? We read the verses These people were very much aware of David's tomb and that his body was still there. His soul had been in Hades after he died until Jesus led the Old Testament saints to heaven. We talked about this before. Just touch on it briefly. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10, after Christ died. Watch this. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now we talked about that. The the Old Testament saints, when they died, they did not go to heaven. They went to Hades. That was the paradise side of hell. That's exactly what it was. It was the paradise side. Because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't wash away, couldn't take away their sin. So they had to wait. They were saved on credit. They had to wait until Jesus died. When he died, he paid the the full price for their sins. He then descended down. He got all those people that were still captive to their sins, so to speak, because the bill had not been paid. He went down. He took all those people out of Hades, out of, out of the paradise side, and he led them right into the presence of God. That's exactly what he did. Watch. The, David was one of those. Watch the next line. David could not have been talking about himself because his soul would remain in Hades until his sin debt was paid by Jesus. 
For all those hundreds of years, his body would surely have returned to dust. Therefore, the presence of David's tomb was proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ based upon David's prophecy. David wasn't talking about himself. Then you have another proof, the witness of the apostles, watch 232. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Peter said, we're all witnesses. Not talking about the whole crowd, no, no, no. But he's talking about the apostles. Watch 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, and then verse 12. It says, Paul writes, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? That was some of those in Corinth were saying that there was no resurrection, and but Jesus had rose from the dead. And so he was witnessed by all the apostles. Another evidence of the resurrection, the events of Pentecost, watch uh, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye see and hear. What's he talking about? The events of Pentecost. He's saying, look, what you've just witnessed is proof that Christ is alive because why, do you, why could he say that? Because he had promised it. Watch this. The events of Pentecost were the fulfillment of Jesus' words to his disciples. Luke 24, 46 through 49. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise. This is Jesus speaking. I send the promise of the Father. That's exactly what Peter is talking about right here in verse 33. I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So the events of Pentecost were proof that Christ was alive. Let me give you one more, and then I'm going to pull this together. The exaltation of the Lord. Watch 34 and 35. For David has not ascended into the heavens, because he's, his tomb's right there. They know that. But he saith himself, watch this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. What's this mean? What's this mean? This means the Father said to the Son, Sit thou on my right hand. Watch verse 35 until I make thy foes thy footstool. That's a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1. Jesus Christ is the Lord that would sit at the Lord, the Father's right hand. Watch verse 36. Therefore, Peter concludes it, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Next page, top of the last page. Peter does not soften his words in any way. He tells his listeners that the very Jesus whom they crucified was declared by the Father to be God the Messiah. He was the promised Messiah, and they had crucified him. Can you imagine the shock as they come to understand what they had done? Watch this. It's very important to see here to see that Peter used the Old Testament prophecies which spoke of Jesus to show just who he was. Peter's listeners needed to understand who Jesus was before they could be saved. They needed that. Because they, had a, they, were mis, they misunderstood Jesus. They didn't believe his words. They didn't believe, the, they didn't understand that John the Baptist was sent before him to prepare the way. They missed everything that God had done. They missed it because of their sin nature suppressed the truth is what happened. 
And they needed to understand who Jesus was. And they needed to have a clear understanding in order to be saved. Watch Matthew 16, 13 through 17. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. John 8, 24 says this, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. I show you that because I want you to understand that people need to know who Christ is. That's going back to what I said in the beginning. Here was a group of individuals that had crucified Jesus. They saw him as some kind of false prophet. They didn't see him as the Messiah. Not at all. They had, apparently, a lot of them had heard his words, witnessed the, the crucifixion, heard rumors of the resurrection. Tried to explain it away because you remember what went around. They said that his disciples had come and stole away the body. So they wrote him off as a false prophet that had a lot of rumors connected to him. In order for them to be saved, they needed to know who Christ was. That's what Peter does. He reaches back to the Old Testament, back to the prophet David and, and his words and, and what he wrote in Psalm 16. And he said, look, this is who you crucified. You crucified the Son of God, the Messiah, the one that was sent to be the King of Israel. You crucified him watch verse 37 if you would uh, Acts 2.37 says this now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do last line on your paper says this this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work that's preaching in the power of the Spirit right there when you have 3,000 people and that's what it's going to be somewhere around 3,000 people that are going to get saved from that sermon not very long a couple quotations but you notice something about this all of this, and, and I want to point this out. Uh, Peter didn't tell any stories, did he? He didn't tell any stories. He didn't give his opinion about anything. You know what he did? He used the Word of God whenever he spoke to these individuals. Probably we could read through that sermon. It would... Uh, Start in verse 14 and go through verse 36. You'll probably read through that in about a minute. About a minute sermon and 3,000 people get saved. You say, how does that happen? Because you got a man who has allowed his past to be in the past, who is functioning in the power of the Spirit of God, who is using the Word of God to teach the people that are listening to him, and he's allowing the Spirit of God to use what he's delivering. That's how that happens. That's how it happens. I could use this in a lot of different ways, but one way that I will use it, I will say this to you. Don't underestimate the power of one individual. One individual that is walking with the Lord in fellowship with the Lord that is controlled by the Spirit of God does not need a hour sermon, does not need a 30-minute sermon, does not need anything of that sort. All they need is the Word of God delivered and let the Spirit of God use it. And this is what happens. This is how the church begins right here. This is, this is it. It's going to go from here and it's going to explode. That's how you get the Word of God in Jerusalem and hand it to 
a couple of what the world would say are a couple of nobodies and say, take this to all the ends of the earth. How in the world does that happen right here? Now, now the message after we get through, after they get saved here, whenever we continue on, whenever we come back next week, now what you have is now you've got 3,000 more people that have the message to carry it out. You see that? And so I'll just encourage you, and I'll say this. If, if you and I are willing to walk where God wants us to walk, be controlled by the Spirit of God, you don't need a big crowd like this. You only need one person. It, it makes me think of that lady, Rose, that I encountered on the road while I'm walking. One person. But then somebody like that gets saved, and then they carry it out. And then, they, then those people carry it out, you see? And it just keeps on going. And that is the greatest need in our world today, without a doubt. People need Christ. We don't. There's a lot of things we think the world needs. But ultimately, if you boil it right down, the world needs Jesus. That's what they need. And it's up to us. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Lord, what an encouragement for us to look at this. Nothing fancy about Peter's message by any means. Nothing uh, with great theological depth, so to speak. Just Just an ordinary fisherman preaching the Word of God for about a minute or two, but in the power of the Spirit, turning 3,000 lives around for they came to know Christ as Savior. 3,000 lives that were saved from the depths of hell because he was willing to proclaim the truth. He was harsh, sure. He was straightforward. That's the way we need to be. People need to know they're sinners, that they're guilty. They need to know that. Lord, they don't need to be pampered, for that won't do any good. And they need to know who Jesus is. And we need to be prepared to share with them who Jesus is and how much he loves them. Father, thank you again. Might you use this for your honor and your glory. Take us home safely. Uh, Lord, bring us back on Sunday ready to be taught by the Spirit. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.